Derek Chang is Associate Professor of History and Asian American Studies at Cornell University, where he's taught since 2002. He's author of Citizens of a Christian Nation, Evangelical Mission, and the Problems of Race in the 19th Century, a comparative study of post-Civil War domestic missions to African Americans in the South and Chinese migrants on the Pacific Coast. Professor Chang has also offered a number of book chapters on the intersection of race and religion. His current research, which we'll hear about today, examines the place of Asians within the segregated American South with particular attention to the relationships among Asian immigrants and African Americans, as well as their relationship to the state. His talk is titled, A New Curve in the Well-Known Color Line, Race, Respectability, and the Multiracial South. So please join me in welcoming Derek Chan. Before I start, I wanna, I wanna thank especially um, Benny Liu for um, helping coordinate this, um, this, this event and for, for being persistent in um, and, and being persistent in, in making sure that I respond to emails, um, uh, and, and to Evan Lespiritu, who um, I got to know last year, and I'm so uh, pleased and honored to, uh, um, to have the, inner, uh, the opportunity to come talk to you today um, and to have the invitation. Um, it was also really nice to, to have a blustery um, tour around this beautiful campus. It's windy today. Um, it's also neat to get to catch up with old friends from, uh, from Durham. Um, uh, there are a whole sort of, there's a cohort of, of, of Dukies around here who are maybe in mourning after last night's basketball results. Um, so if I'm a little out of sorts, it may be because of that. Um, all right, so I want to begin today um, by asking you to cast your mind to the South in, 19, in the 1920s to think a little bit especially about Greenville, Mississippi, which lies in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. It's a port city on the river. Um, and the 1920s were the height of Jim Crow, right? the height of a system, um, a separate and unequal legal, extra-legal, and extra-legal system designed for the political, economic, and social subjugation of black Southerners. Um, now, the picture most of us get when we sort of conjure the South is a black and white picture, both in the sense of that the photos are often in black and white, but also in the sense of um, the segregated South being a system of whites and blacks, right? So we, we think of separate facilities, separate drinking fountains, separate bathrooms, separate schools, right? This was the South of Plessy v. Ferguson, where the Supreme Court ruled that the law of the land was that separate and un a separate was in fact equal. Right. Um, this is a generation before the Brown versus the Board of Education decision in 1954, a generation before desegregation. But I want to I provide a slightly different picture of the South, a slightly different picture specifically of Greenville. In 1920, a child born to a Chinese immigrant parent living in Greenville attempted to enroll in a school reserved for white children. Now, Prior to 1920, for decades, uh, the, the few hundred Chinese in Mississippi, who had um, some of whom had children, would send their children to black schools. There was a tacit understanding. There was a tacit understanding that, that Chinese children lay on the black side of the infamous color line. Now, there's a broader context to this. Right? The Jim Crow legal regime, pioneered by the Mississippi Constitution in 1890, which not only restricted voting rights and marriage. Um, between races, but also mandated that, quote, separate schools shall be maintained for children of white and colored races. Now, a few years later, um, in the mid-1920s, a similar challenge would begin um, and result in a Supreme Court decision in 1927, a, a decision called the Lum v. Rice decision, which I'll, I'll talk about um, uh, a little bit later. Um, but this was even before that case. Um, and I want to, um, I'll speculate in a bit why Chinese families in 1920, um, during the 1920s, were hoping to move to white schools. Um, but, but first, I want to focus on the ruling of the state's attorney general in this first case. Um, it wasn't a court case. It was a petition before the Mississippi uh, Department of Education. And the state attorney general um, ruled um, specifically this. The conclusion, he said, seems inescapable. Chinese, the Chinese child should be excluded by the trustees from attending a white school because such child is not a member of the white or Caucasian race, but is a member of the yellow 
or Mongolian race. So for, for the Attorney General, a guy named Frank Roberson, the non-whiteness of the petitioner was the salient fact. As the Topeka Plain, Plain Dealer reported, he interpreted the constitutional re reference to the colored race to include all accepting the Caucasian race, so that Chinese children must go to the schools with members of the Negro race if they attend public schools in this state. Right, there's another little tidbit in the case that's just a line in the opinion that, that addresses the fact that this student who was petitioning may not have in fact had both parents who were of Chinese descent, but in fact one parent who is Chinese and one, chi one parent who is black. And I'll talk about and speculate about that because I think it's a really interesting little, little moment. Um, but, but Roberson also uh, declared that colored means not only a Negro, but persons of mixed blood. Right? That was the ruling. So this ruling, which was soon to be eclipsed by the Lum case, um, uh, was at the time reported on widely by the black press. Um, in fact, um, the black press reported that the case received considerable comment throughout the state as well as other sections of the South. Roberson's decision, one newspaper concluded, puts a new curve in the well-known color line. That's where the name of the talk comes from. And I want to talk um, today about the shape of that curve. All right. so, so what I'm going to talk about today is, is really research for a book project um, on, on Asians and segregated South. Um, some of my findings are rather preliminary, and I'm trying to pull together um, from disparate and, in certain ways, fragmentary sources um, a story of Asians in the segregated South. Today, I'm going to focus mostly on a well-known story of Chinese within Mississippi. Right? Um, this is the story that most people know about when, when you talk about um, Asians in the segregated South. So what I want to do today is um, first sketch the racial landscape um, and especially the place of Chinese within the racial landscape of the Mississippi region. Um, as one of the more um, well-known cases of Asians in the segregated South, uh, we have lots of literature, right? And most of that literature focuses on um, this group that lies between black and white, right? And there's a little bit of an exceptionalist argument to it. That the Mississippi Chinese represent something different from, say, the Chinese who lived in San Francisco that we know a whole lot about, or the Chinese who lived in, in, in New York who we know, um, we know a lot about as well. Um, but I want to look at the Chinese in Mississippi not as an ethnographic case and not as an exceptional case. I want to look at them um, as agents who are trying to shift the color line, right? Um, so, so I want to make an argument that their agency, how they tried to negotiate Jim Crow, um, highlights the fluidity of race, of the construction of race, within a system often thought of as rigid, right? As black and white. Where do we find space? How do we do this? Um, I want to I want to make another argument um, about Asian Americans um, um, and the challenges of negotiating that space within a white supremacist society, right? In which whiteness is desirable, and a single form of non-whiteness seems to be the only alternative, right? And I think this actually has broader implications um, for for the way in which Asian Americans um, in our contemporary moment are negotiating. Um, racial structures, and, and we can talk about this during the Q&A. I think actually this has something to say about um, our moment um, with, in particular, affirmative action and the recent um, Harvard, Harvard lawsuit. Um, finally, I want to make the argument that concerns over religious and cultural respectability play key roles in determining how Asian Americans um, find their place within U.S. racial systems. All right. So, so I want to return first, I want to do this by returning first to the Mississippi Delta region and especially Greenville. Right? So um, Greenville is kind of a, like, you know, it's an important city on the Mississippi in, in the Mississippi Delta, but it's not a particularly well-known place. Um, and in fact, for me, the way I learned about Greenville originally was that it's the birthplace or a birthplace of the American blues, right? Um, in fact, Greenville sits in a region of northwest Mississippi, um, which is kind of the imagined um, birthplace of the blues. Um, and the blues, as a, as a kind of West African musical tradition, um, transplanted to America via the Middle Passage and enslaved Africans, um, was reshaped and transformed by work and struggle 
and emerged at the dawn of the 20th century um, in this region, right, northwest Mississippi, um, when folk tradition encountered new instrumentation and modern co commercial horizons, according to one, one historian. Um, August Wilson talks about the world that gave birth to the blues as brutal and beautiful. So I want to talk a little bit about the brutal and the beautiful for a moment. Um, the other thing we might know about Greenville, Mississippi, is um, the 1927 flood. Um, it's the subject of a, of a wonderful book by, by a historian named John Barry. Um, it's a deadly flood, right? Um, spring rains came early in April um, in 1927, uh, swelling tributaries, swelling the Mississippi, um, and breaching levees. The worst levee failure occurred 30 miles north of Greenville um, and resulted in uh, a release of water, according to one source, at a rate equivalent to that of Niagara Falls and unleashing cataclysmic natural forces on the communities adjacent to the river. Disaster in the blues, the brutal and beautiful. Right? Songs were generated through the blues about this particular moment. One of them, Charlie Patton's High Water Everywhere. Um, in High Water Everywhere, Charlie Patton uh, sings about the rising water chasing him from Sumner to Leland in Mississippi and from Leland to Greenville. He sings um, at Greenville, the levee broke, rose most everywhere, the water at Greenville and Leland, Lord it done rose everywhere. Lonnie Johnson in Broken Levee Blues takes up where Patton leaves off. Images of fear, fear of the rising tide, fear of drowning, fear of the police imposing Jim Crow vagrancy laws on black men who had lost their homes in the flood, fear of being pressed into labor as a convict. This fear marked Johnson's blues. I'd rather leave my home because I can't live there no more, he sings, and later, the police run me all from Cairo, all through Arkansas, and put me in jail behind those cold iron bars. And finally, the police say work, fight, or go to jail. I say ain't totin' no sack. All right. Black Southerners around Greenville sought high ground at the levee, um, um, on one of the levees, um, which eventually became the Greenville Red Cross camp. But this Red Cross camp was no refuge. Um, in fact, they were referred to as peonage pens. Right? Local police worked with landowners to coerce labor. The National Guard functioned primarily as prison guards, keeping black workers um, and black homeless black, black men and women um, at bay. Um, uh, African Americans who tried to escape the Red Cross camp because they were being pressed into labor, were beaten, and a handful were shot. According to William Percy, whose father, the former Senator Leroy Percy, was in charge of the camp, um, claimed that the guards were guilty of acts which profoundly and justly made the Negroes fear them. Right? So in some ways, the conditions in that Red Cross camp may be extraordinary in the sense that they were a response to a particularly cataclysmic, cataclysmic event. But in many other ways, Right? The conditions at that Red Cross camp were uh, representative of the quite ordinary workings of Jim Crow. The conditions about which Patton and Johnson sang, the conditions marked by displacement, violence, and expropriated labor were at the center of this system. Um, so Greenville, after all, lay in the heart of the, the Cotton South, the South of sharecropping and debt peonage. Right? The system that Douglas Blackman has called slavery by another name. Even as, right, even as black Southerners could experience Greenville in this particular way, the white residents of Greenville, particularly white elites, had a different understanding of that place. Desperate, the desperation in Patton's song and the fear in Johnson's, um, Johnson's blues seemed a world away from the lives of these white Southerners. Poet, writer, and lawyer um, William Alexander Percy was one of the most prominent members of the town. Right? His father was a senator. So he was the guy in charge of the, um, the Red Cross camp. Um, William, William Percy grew up in Greenville, and he remembered it fondly. I loved Greenville and never wanted any other place for home. It was, he claimed, a lovable town. Now, this is the same lovable town um, which, in 1921, saw um, an attempt to raise a KKK chapter, right? Um, 
Of course, in his memoir in 1943, he recounts this moment as a moment when white elites stood up to the KKK and faced them down. And he concludes, white folks and colored folks, that's what we were. And some of us were nice, and some of us weren't. Right. So Percy had a family friend, also a writer, um, named David Cohn. He was born and raised in Greenville as well. And he recounted the town of his childhood um, uh, and he, he remembered it fondly, too. As he recounted it, he liked to talk about the shifting land and the turbulent weather. The earth of the delta in which I lived, he remembered, is a violent earth. For Cone, the racial order of Greenville was part of the natural surroundings. Against this landscape, variable, heat tortured, shifting, amid swamps dark and mysterious and lost, in the presence of the mighty river rolling onward to the, the Mexican Gulf, under suns and swarming stars, Whites and Negroes painfully tried to work out their singular destiny together, Cohn wrote. In this natural world for Cohn, um, both whites and Negroes, these are his words, of the Delta, through a tragedy not of their making, were prisoners of their environment. So Cohn reproduced an image of the South endemic among white elites, a South of supposedly organic and hierarchical race relations, a South of white paternalism and privilege and black acquiescence. For Cone, black and white residents were trapped in a system as natural as the Mississippi River and the stars in the sky. But the South, and, the part of, and this part of the South in particular, had other residents who weren't part of that organic order of things that didn't seem to fit so neatly into what Cone might think of um, as the natural order of race relations. Right? For Chinese res residents of the Delta, both they themselves and the society they were part of struggled to find a place in the seemingly binary and natural organic racial order. So I want to talk a little bit about the way in which Chinese agency, right, the actions of Chinese to find a way, um, find a place within this, this hierarchical and natural, supposedly natural order, actually um, demonstrates or highlights the constructed aspects um, of, of the segregated South, right, the way in which whiteness and blackness are reconstructed. So there was a long, there, even by 1920, there was a decently long history of, of Chinese in the South. They first came to the South as replacement labor for formerly enslaved blacks during Reconstruction. Um, and this, this movement to recruit Chinese labor to replace black labor on, on plantations peaked in the late 1870s when it became clear that the importation of Chinese labor was a little too expensive. Um, that the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 eventually shut the door on the, the migration of Chinese laborers to the United States, and when the institution of Jim Crow legal regimes actually made black labor um, relatively inexpensive, right? It, it sort of accomplished at least part of that task. Um, but the association with plantation labor during this long period of um, emancipation and reconstruction um, meant, as James Lowen has observed, from their first entry to the state, the Chinese were defined as status equals of Negroes. Right? The Chinese, after all, were a racialized population of migrant workers meant to replace a racialized population of enslaved workers. Right? So that, that association with blackness from the very origins of, of Chinese entrance into the South became crucial. Now, the Chinese wouldn't stay on the, the plantations after their contracts were over or after their leases um, had expired. Um, and they moved into a kind of a small niche part of the economy. They, they opened grocery stores, right? um, grocery stores that, that catered to black clients specifically. Um, the growth, though, um, in the meantime, of the economy of, of places like Greenville, towns like Greenville, and other parts of the Delta meant that, um, that as Chinese were leaving plantations, they, they came to, um, in other parts of the South, in parts of Arkansas and Louisiana in particular, um, they, moved, they moved to Mississippi. So that by the turn of the 20th century, more than 200 Chinese lived there. By 1920, more than 360 resided there. In Greenville alone, there were 50 Chinese grocery stores in 1920. Um, but, but even with the movement of Chinese from plantation laborers, to small merchants, um, even with that, with that movement, the racialized link persisted. 
As James Lowen has shown, the shift from laborers to grocers, from workers to merchants, did little to change, in his words, the def that definition in the minds of the white populace, right? And that, that ceiling is something that's crucially important, and I want us to sort of mark that. I'll talk about that in a moment. All right. Um, so one such store was owned by a gentleman named Bao Zhou Yi in the heart of Black Greenville. The store was a block and a half from two African-American churches formed during the ferment of emancipation. Now, the location of Yi's store and the nature of his clientele was typical of Chinese grocers in the Delta. They inhabited the same neighborhoods as working class blacks, and as I said before, catered almost exclusively to black customers. So for black workers, this turned out to be a good deal. They could go to Chinese-owned stores and escape kind of the cycle of debt from using plantation stores or working with um, or, or, or using stores owned by white employers. Um, for Chinese grocers, they saw this just as an economic opportunity. So, but if, if Yi was sort of um, fairly typical as a Chinese grocer who, who, who operated and catered to black clientele, um, uh, he was unusual in the sense that he had had a relationship or he had entered a relationship with a black or mulatto woman. The mostly male migration from China and Mississippi's prohibition on white and non-white marriage meant that as one Chinese man in the Delta interviewed in the 1970s recalled, prior to the 1920s, if a Chinese man did have a woman, it had to be a Negro. Right, so the, if, the evidence suggests that the incidence of marriage among Chinese and, and blacks was relatively uncommon one, one study surmises that as late as 1946, less than one Chinese male in 20 had a black or mulatto wife. But that figure doesn't account for unions made outside of legally sanctioned marriage. And in fact, and in fact uh, Bao Zhou Yi never married the mother of his children. All right. Josephine Zhu, um, Bao Zhou Yi's partner, had moved from Greenville, from Cahoma, um, Mississippi, and from Cahoma, uh, to Cahoma from Louisiana, which is where she was married, in which I speculate she met her first husband. Right? Her first husband was a man named Ju Jung, who had come to, come to uh, Louisiana in 1872 as part of that initial migration of replacement labor for formerly enslaved blacks. Josephine worked as a clerk in Ju's store um, and moved to Greenville after Ju died. Now, with, with her first husband, with this husband, Ju Jung, um, Josephine had two children, right? Helen, who in 1920 um, was a 20-year-old, sometimes part-time waitress, part-time cook, but was listed as out of work in 1920. Um, and Willie, a son who worked sometimes as a porter on the Mississippi River. And again, in 1920, he's listed as unemployed in, in the um, manuscript census. Um, in addition to Willie and Helen, Josephine had, um, had two children with Bao Zhou Yi. Um, Bernice was 10 in 1920, and Earl was 9 um, in 1920. Now, it's, it's an educated guess on my part because the, um, the, the historical record's a little spotty here, um, but it's, it's my sense that either Earl or Bernice was the child in that 1920 petition that I started with, right? Um, they were the only mixed Chinese black family in town with school-aged children. Now, um, I think it's significant um, that the petition, right, um, that, let's go back here. It's significant that the petition came from mixed Chinese black family. And um, I want to I sort of demonstrate or try to um, highlight the transition from a petition that begins with a mixed Chinese black family and moves to a fully Chinese family a few years later, right, the Lum, the Lum case. Um, the petitioning family argued that the division that was important wasn't colored and white in the, uh, the Mississippi State Constitution. Um, rather, it argued that the important division was black and non-black, right? So, um, so by virtue of of Josephine, a black and mulatto woman, being married to, or having children with, not being married to, being, having children with a Chinese man, effectively their children should be constituted as non-black. And so in the attempt in this petition, the attempt in this petition was, try, was, was an attempt to try to move the color line from 
um, from black and white to, to black and non-black. Now we know, of course, that, that that petition failed, right? The ruling of the, 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 um, the opinion of the Attorney General ruled that, it, that, that in fact Chinese and mixed folks were, were defined as colored. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, but first, it's really interesting, or it's super important to think a little bit about the reasons, the reasons that that family decided to lodge the petition in the first place. It's possible, right, and some of this is speculation, it's possible that Josephine looked at the life chances um, um, of her younger children through the lens of the experiences of her older children, right? Willie and Helen were out of work, right? Casual laborers who had a tough time um, uh, finding, finding jobs and who were still living at home at 18 and 20, right? For, for Josephine, um, the fates of Earl and Bernice rode on whether they could transcend blackness and find greater opportunities, right? James Lone has argued in reference to the Lum case that the, the, the uh, that Chinese families hoped to, quote, evade their black classification and did not want to utilize even the existing Negro schools. Right? So it became a case of trying to, to find a way of, uh, for mo uh, social mobility. Whatever the case is, we know that although Greenville schools, white and black, had a regional reputation for being much better funded than the rural counterparts, the city spent $85 per white student and just $17 per black student, right? So it becomes fairly apparent there's a material reason why you would want to send your kid not to a black school, but to a white school. So it isn't too much to surmise then that the structural realities of the Jim Crow South were manifest to Josephine and her children. Now, the consequences of the designation of black or colored and what appeared to be the binary and oppressive racial system of the segregated South were obvious. Rather than maintaining their position as heirs to the experiences sung about by Johnson and Patton and experienced by thousands of black residents of the Delta, Josephine and her children sought to move to the other side of the color line. Now, as I said, the Zhang Yi petition ultimately failed, but it was an early indication that the persistent affiliation of Chinese with non-whiteness or with blackness was beginning to chafe. Right? They were experiencing a ceiling. Chinese men had traveled to the Delta not not for abstract notions of freedom or shelter from oppression, but for economic gain and social mobility. Over the course of 50 or 60 years in the South, Chinese Mississippians had moved out of plantation labor to become merchants. In the framework of the anti-Chinese movement of the late 19th and early 20th century, the status of merchant was supposed to protect you, right? So all of the anti-Chinese anti immigration acts, right, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, um, specified that merchants could come, but laborers couldn't, right? Um, the idea was that your merchant status was supposed, to, was supposed to protect you. But even as they supported families and communities in China with their earnings, even as they sought to make livings for themselves as grocers, um, as James Lowen has argued, Chinese in Mississippi found that their virtuous life counted for naught with the white population. As one Chinese resident of the Delta remembered, we had no choice, we had no chance to prove ourselves. We couldn't bring our families over. They shut us out of society. Then they said we didn't count. Right? So, so by the 1920s, Chinese in Mississippi are experiencing a kind of limit, a hard limit on their social mobility. Um, even with the relationship between Chinese grocers and their black clients and the residents of the neighborhoods in which they live, the relationship was uneasy. To be sure, the Chinese grocery store developed into a gathering place for black laborers in towns and cities and for black sharecroppers in the country. It was a lunchroom, a place to have a quick meal or a snack of sardines and crackers. It was a convenient place to grab a beer after work or on the rare day off. But for Chinese merchants who aspired to shift from racialized labor to respectable merchant, a close association with their black clientele would, could be damaging, particularly in the eyes of the local elite. So in David Cohn's, um, David Cohn's memoir, it's no surprise that the one time that the Chinese sort of show up is in, um, as he's recounting a story 
um, between a, a kind of a dispute between two black women that started at, at what he says is a nearby grocery store and dance hall that resulted in a homicide, right? The very opposite of respectability. These are, um, there's, a, there's, a persistent, um, there's a persistent relationship or link to black working class life in the Delta. So despite the shared space and the feeling of fellowship that might have developed, the economic relationship and the sense of racial difference and the aspirations of Chinese to transcend blackness um, meant that the barrier between the two groups was difficult to overcome. Right? Chinese in the Delta constituted a classic case of the middleman minority. Right? Our, best, our best empirical study of the group concludes that usually the Chinese merchant kept somewhat aloof from his black neighbors. In addition to racial, cult, racial cultural and linguistic differences, the Chinese were soon in an occupational class higher than all but a few Delta Negroes. In the wake of the Yi Jung decision, right, and the fact that um, the fact that the petitioner was a mixed black and Chinese family um, was significant, maybe not so much for white Greenville uh, residents or Mississippians, or even black Greenville residents or Mississippians, but it was super significant for Chinese residents of the Delta. Because even as, even as they were um, trying to transcend blackness, they began to, sh and, and as they were shunning the black community, um, Chinese, um, Chinese families began to devise another legal strategy to try to um, break into the white schools, right? So maybe, um, maybe even if the earlier petition had outlawed, um, had outlawed the entrance of Chinese families into white schools, the fact that the petitioners were mixed, of mixed parentage made a difference. So um, Martha Lum, the daughter of Gong Lum, a grocer, and Catherine, an adopted daughter of, merchant, of Chinese merchants, um, in 1924 um, lodged a petition, started a court case to try to, um, to enter white schools in Rosedale, uh, at, at the Rosedale Consolidated High School, just north of Greenville. Now, their story has been the subject of, of lots of scholarship and a recent um, fairly evocative um, book by a journalist named Adrian Berard. Um, and the legal int intricacies of the, the case are um, recounted in a book called A Different Shade of Justice um, by, a, by a wonderful historian named Stephanie Hinerschitz. Um, and both of these are, uh, authors argue for kind of the civil rights legacy of the Lum case and the Lum family, a generation before the Brown decision. Um, but I want to provide a slightly different perspective. Um, I want to focus on some of the language of the decision and then the aftermath of the decision. Um, so before the lower court, Lum's attorneys argued that Martha was not a member of the colored race, nor is she of mixed blood, but she is pure Chinese. Martha's family, were, they were staking a claim for a kind of third race here, right? Um, and the lower court initially accepted the reasoning that the Chinese weren't colored. But they also ruled that they weren't white, so the state attorney general found room to appeal. When the, face, uh, fin when the case finally arrived at the state Supreme Court in the spring of 1925, the panel of judges ruled unanimously to overturn the lower court's decision. Martha, as a Chinese woman, was in fact colored in the eyes of the law. So drawing on the state's anti-miscegenation law, which specified that marriages between whites and persons of at least one-eighth Mongolian blood were unlawful, the judges opined that Chinese people fell on the colored side of the color line. Um, Lum's, Lum's family, Lum's uh, attorneys appealed to the Supreme Court, um, which uh, finally decided the case in 1927. In addition to upholding the right of states to segregate schools, Chief Justice William Howard Taft, the former president, determined that as a member of the yellow race, all Chinese in Mississippi were classified as colored. Right? The highest court in the land had spoken. The Chinese were non-white. Right? So they would be white and non-white. Now I wanna, I wanna take a few minutes here to, to speak a little bit about the aftermath. So for, for many Chinese um, in the Delta, uh, the Gong Lum decision um, was traumatic, right? The oral history of the community um, and the various oral histories of the community um, uh, recount the way in which the, the decision was um, a kind of turning point. For many Chinese, as um, did the Lum family, um, it meant leaving Mississippi, 
to the other side of the Arkansas, uh, to the Mississippi River, to Arkansas, where they might be able to enter white schools. Others hired tutors to avoid black schools. One Chinese resident at the Delta remembered, we never went to no white school. They didn't let us do it. Um, so, so his family hired tutors. Um, but for the most others, especially those in larger towns and cities, the desire to distance themselves from black Mississippians meant pursuing educational opportunities outside the public school system. So whereas white schools may have shunned local Chinese, white churches did not. Protestant denominations in the 1920s and 30s had had a long history of missionary efforts among Chinese people, both in China itself and within the United States. Domestically, home missions began in the mid-19th century with the first large-scale migration of Chinese to the Pacific Coast. Um, and American evangelicals and even a handful of politicians and policymakers understood these mission projects variously as proselytizing efforts that would contribute to the conversion of China to the return mi through return migration. These assimilative ventures to transform a strange population that threatened the nation's moral and social fabric, and even for for a small group of relatively progressive missionaries, pathways to citizenship for a new immigrant group. Um, regardless, right, these, mission, these mission projects um, uh, uh, provided the possibility for sustained interracial and intercultural contact, although not unproblematic um, interracial and intercultural contact. Um, domestic missionaries among efforts among the Chinese um, uh, coordinated by national mission organizations focused primarily on the Western US. Right, the centers, the centers of Chinese migration. But in towns in Texas and Florida and Louisiana and Virginia, individual congregations took up the work of Christian conversion among local and relatively small Chinese populations throughout the South. The towns of Mississippi, of the Mississippi Delta were no different. So in 1928, the Reverend L.A. Street established a night school for Chinese adults in the Pres Presbyterian Church in Rosedale. The congregation had been organized only a few years earlier and its, um, its numbers were modest. But Street, um, who had come to Rosedale from Tennessee, felt called to create a space for Chinese resi residents in the town. Um, it's possible that he hoped to showcase the brand new building that the congregation had just built. Um, but this new space wasn't, wasn't an integrated one. Chinese weren't invited to Bible study or Sunday school or to worship with white congregants. It nevertheless created the foundation for what developed into a parallel institution for the town's Chinese. Now, it turns out the street's mission was well-timed. As Chinese families sought alternatives to black schools, they encouraged street to shift the focus from adult Bible and religious education to children's education full stop. Soon, even as a handful of Chinese families in Rosedale, a few years removed from the Lum decision, thought they might be able to fly under the radar and begin to enroll their children in white schools, the superintendent in the county um, contacted the Reverend Street and proposed that he, Street, transform the focus of his mission from a religious, uh, religious mission to an overtly educational mission. Offering oversight and funding from the county, uh, superintendent A.K. Eccles hoped that the creation of a Chinese school, a school that operated uh, for the benefit of a population that didn't see themselves as black and that the state recognized as non-white, would be a reasonable solution under the auspices of the separate but equal framework of the Plessy decision. So in September 1933, Reverend Street brought his proposal before the elders of his church, um, who approved, quote, an offer by the Board of Supervisors of Bol Bolivar County to L.A. Street to conduct a school for Chinese uh, students not privileged to attend our local school. Now, it's important to note that when the school opened, it did so under the auspices of, a, of public and state authority, right? Considered a branch or an auxiliary of Rosedale's public schools and serving towns throughout the western part of the county, in addition to Rosedale, it was nonetheless housed in a private Christian church, right? This is an incredibly creative and maybe legally dubious um, uh, a proposition. But it wasn't the only enterprise in the Delta. There was a, um, the, Baptist, the Baptist Church in Greenville um, opened a school under the auspices of the, the, that, that county's, Washington County's uh, public school system. Um, and the superintendent of schools, E.E. E. Bass, uh, worked with a local school teacher uh, to establish a mission school, again, that operated as a de facto public, uh, public school for Chinese. 
Um, and their plan began soon after the Lum decision and opened as a separate institution for 20 Chinese students. In nearby Cleveland, Mississippi, just 20 miles east of Rosedale and 40 miles or so northeast of Greenville, the First Baptist Church there um, helped establish a Chinese mission school in 1937. Now this didn't have, um, this, this wasn't officially connected to any state or county, um, county um, uh, agency, but in fact, operated again as a de facto public school, right? Um, both teachers at the school attempted, in, in the words of one of them, to utilize the same curriculum used in public schools, right? Um, for white missionaries, or white ministers in their congregation, these, these mission schools were extensions of their evangelical faith. But as I've written about in other contexts, these projects were never only about the souls of their con converts. Or rather, religious conversion in the context of, of domestic mission, the context of domestic missions, was conceived of broadly to include education, the inculcation of cultural knowledge, and the modification of behavior. For Street, who held out hope for the Christian conversion of Chinese residents of Rosedale, um, and who felt called to serve, operating a school from the Presbyterian Church may have represented a kind of faith-based social engagement. Um, Street and ministers like him um, may have originally hoped to bait the hook of conversion with education, but in missionary theory and in the practices shaped in part by the needs and desires and agency of Chinese mission participants themselves, over time it became difficult to distinguish between hook and bait. Patricia Wong remembered that, quote, my daddy used to go there to learn English. He didn't really believe in Christianity, he would tell us so, but to fit into the Delta, you just have to be one. And in fact, quite apart from a discussion of Chinese converts to Christianity, a broader view of the significance of these mission schools is evident in the linking of educational projects on one hand and cultural and social projects on the other. After the Supreme Court foreclosed the possibility of sending their children to Chinese white, uh, to white schools, um, Chinese families in the Delta, um, for Chinese families in the Delta not sending their children to black schools was a central method of trying to decouple Chineseness from blackness. But the location of those schools within white Christian institutions was just as significant. Proximity to respectable whiteness was as important as distance from blackness. As Patricia Wong's oral history suggests, Christianity was central to the strategy of social and, and perhaps even racial mobility. One, one long-time resident of the Delta remembered that, and in fact, acquiring a quality education was secondary to the acquisition of a particular form of cultural and social capital. I remember, I remember he said, the mission school when I was just a little girl. Or he said, excuse me, I remember the mission school when I was just a little girl. It was like a social gathering of sorts. All the Chinese kids from around town would be in the same classroom, and we would spend most of the time reading from the Bible and learning how to eat with fork, knives, and spoons, and learning how to be good Baptists. Indeed, the evidence suggests that the education was, the education was only one part of the project of these mission schools. Educationally, these mission schools weren't particularly good. Right? James Lowen concluded that the schools weren't equal to the white schools, but far superior to no school or the rudimentary Negro makeshift institutions. One alumnus of the Green, Greenville School observed, the Chinese school was really mostly just play. I don't think too much of it. I didn't think too much of it, but it was better than nothing. One elderly woman neatly encapsulated the broader aims of these schools in an oral history recorded by Robert Kwan in the early 1980s. Chinese had engaged with the mission in Cleveland through call to, quote, be accepted into the community. We wanted our children to go to white schools and learn how to read and write, so we went to the church, so we went to church, um, and the white sauce is okay. We had to show them that we were, um, we had to show them that we were not colored. Right? The notion of racial and class respectability busters these aspirations. Another one of Kwan's informants recalled that it was important to show that Chinese too abided by Christian prohibitions on drinking, gambling, and smoking, and also believed in a Christian emphasis on, quote, keeping the family close together. In fact, the adult school that preceded the opening of the Rosedale Mission School foreshadowed this politics of respectability. When women attended the night school, 
Um, women who attended the night school received an education in white middle class southern womanhood, learning how to keep a proper household, to cook proper meals for their families, and to entertain with proper manners. Jack Chow remembered that white Baptist women helped his mother learn, quote, how to make catfish and collard greens and how to set up table with knives and forks, how in short to be a good Christian and learn American ways so she could teach her children. So there are two points to sort of think about in, in, in relation to this, I think. Um, one is, is an irony, um, a result is an irony of the, um, uh, that stems from the Yi Jung decision, right? Um, in an attempt to provide a kind of respectable um, education for Chinese children, um, they joined these white mission churches, and the white mission churches um, were very, very um, uh, forthright with their barring of mixed children from attending, right? So, so the, the first case that animates, that animates the attempt to desegregate um, schools in the Mississippi Delta, which stems from a, um, a mixed child. Um, in fact, um, in the solution to all of this, that mixed child wouldn't have been able to attend. Now, some of this is understandable, right, given, um, given uh, part of the goal of these churches um, was, to, was to distance Chinese from, from, from black Southerners, right? Um, uh, but what we get a sense of in this is the limit, right, the, um, one of the limits of the strategy of Chinese Southerners. We were told not to mix with biracial children, um, recalled one, uh, one former student, because my mama thought they might influ influence us into behaving like their parents, right? So respectability became a linchpin there, and blackness was associated with things that weren't good. The racial aspirations of Delta Chinese were framed and encouraged by the imperatives of the larger white supremacist society. For the whites who ran mission schools, the public resources made available to these church-based enterprises were contingent upon the end of social associations between blacks and Chinese. Within the Jim Crow South, the differential allocation of resources helped to maintain and perpetuate racial inequality, and Chinese schools were both separate from and better funded than black schools in the Delta, but they were also separate from white schools. But the second point to think about um, is really um, another kind of irony, right? So even as, um, even as Chinese uh, engaged these schools to try to distance themselves from, white, uh, from black Southerners and to try to um, uh, uh, take on the sort of trappings of white respectability, over time these schools also became specifically Chinese spaces, right? um, places where Chinese people could practice particular cultural tradition, traditions. They celebrated the new, new Lunar New Year. They engaged in certain marriage ceremonies even and had their own cemetery and funeral rites. Right? Um, so even in, in an attempt then to move away from blackness and towards whiteness, Chinese people were, were creating a distinctive, a distinctive place within, within the segregated South. It may, have been, um, it may have been not black, but it was also distinctly, and dis uh, distinctly not white. In the Jim Crow South, Chinese saw their path to social mobility first through an economic strategy and then through a racial strategy and then finally through a religious and cultural strategy. They had tried economically to ascend the middle class to middle class status, but even as merchants, they found their acceptance limited. With the Lum decision, they became tarred with the brush of non-whiteness, and they saw their attempts to access better resourced white schools blocked. In response, they worked with local white ministers and elites to create separate Chinese schools and churches where they hoped that an association with respectable Christianity and white institutions would enable them to transcend their association with black Mississippians. But two particular outcomes here are noteworthy, and this is where I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, in the attempt to shift their position in the Jim Crow South from non-white to non-black, Chinese residents of the Delta forged a strategy that relied specifically on the acquisition of particular forms of social and cultural capital, rather than one that exposed and attempted to transform the material and racial underpinnings of the Jim Crow system. At the same time, they experienced the limits of religious and class respectability within that racial system. Christian conversion and middle class behavior only got them so far. Even as they gained support from white elites, they were never quite white enough. Chinese Mississippi, 
Uh, Chinese in Mississippi may have traveled some distance from blackness, but if whiteness was their aim, that particular destination would prove elusive. Thank you. So I